All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Matt, for having me here today. I tend to move around quite a bit, so this wireless, you're probably gonna see me trip a little bit. I, um, I'm blown away by the amount of help that has been put in front of you guys today. I hope that you guys uh, find a way to take it advantage of that. And I see you guys moving around, and uh, I know you guys have been sitting here. I have too. Um, I want to do something with you guys because I teach, uh, I shouldn't say teach, but I do a study hall at Sonoma State, and everybody's on their phone, just like myself. And I see all this help that's out in front of you guys, and I would like you guys to think for a second, is there a couple people in your life that maybe impacted you? Obviously your mom and dad, I mean, that's why you're here, right? But was there people, teammates, coaches, teachers, maybe a third grade teacher, sixth grade teacher, uh, somebody that coached you, could even been like in Little League or CYO, something small like that, that made an impact on you and maybe has a little piece, a reason, or a little bit of impact on you that the reason why you're here today sitting on a college campus, because there's not a whole lot of people like you right now. You're very fortunate to be exactly where your feet are, right here on a college campus. I actually want to give you guys an opportunity because I think it's really important to give back and to show appreciation. I think when you show appreciation, the people you show it to give far more than what you expect out of them. So I'd like you to bring out your phones just for like 30 seconds. Bring out your phones and can you find somebody in that phone? Maybe it's just a friend, maybe it's somebody next to you that you can say thank you for touching my life and having a little bit of impact for, for me being on a college campus. Can you do that like 30 seconds? And let's just get that out of the way and you guys can put your phone down. All right, 10 seconds. All right, I want to say this is that I don't know if this was your plan five years ago, 10 years ago. I don't know if you dreamed about being right here at uh, Santa Rosa Junior College, but I was just like you 31 years ago. Um, I'm going to be 50 in a couple of months. 31 years ago, I was just like you sitting in stands just like this, listening to a guest speaker, and I went to Diablo Valley College. And um, it wasn't my dream to go there, but that was what was put in front of me. And I did well enough that I ended up at Sonoma State, and Coach Markovich brought up something, uh, what the coach said there that uh, we talk about every single day. I'm very fortunate to still be coaching there, and he talks about it's just the way we like it. So no matter what's happening, it's just the way we like it. Um, and I use that. I'm glad that Coach Markovich brought that up. But one thing that impacted me when I went there was he said something every day that, uh, that really touched my life. And I didn't know when I was your age how much it would impact me. He said, uh, if you're not getting the results that you want in life or on the baseball field, you see, if you don't find yourself in the lineup, then go home and look in the mirror and figure out what you can do to make yourself better so that you can get yourself in the lineup. And if you're not getting the results in life, figure out what it is that you need and who it is that, that can help you. And it really impacted me. I, I remember thinking about that. I would share it with other people. Um, I, I want to show you something about Sonoma State, too, because I wasn't really academic. Is there anybody uh, in the stands that's like first generation that's never, the family's never been to college? Yeah, well, congratulations. You need to give yourself a lot of credit. Uh, I would say probably 10, 15 years ago, if you were to ask me, you know, how long did it take you to graduate, I probably would have said, you know, like, like maybe like six years, you know, six years. I wasn't really proud of it, but I'm going to tell you what, I'm really proud of it. Because what I started, I finished, and it wasn't pretty. In fact, the other day, not the other day, it was probably a month and a half ago, I had to go get my transcripts, and I did way worse than what I thought. But um, I did graduate, and I'm really proud of that. It, it, it took a while to do that, but when I got on the college campus, I'm reminded by these people that came up here that I didn't know what I was doing because my parents didn't go. I was just lucky enough that I was decent enough to play baseball well enough to end up there. It wasn't an academic venture. It was an athletic venture, and I ended up there, and there was two people that the baseball coach said, oh, well, you should go into this office, you know, and get some counseling. Um, in order to register, find out what classes you need. That's how little I knew. And um, I went into this office and these guys were kind of joking around. 
uh, Dr. Ken Flynn and Dr. Earl, and they were like, oh, another baseball player, you know, ha, huh, huh, ha, whatever. And I didn't know what I was doing. I felt like I was being made fun of a little bit. Those two guys helped me so much, they ended up at my wedding. And uh, so I take it really serious that there's people on this campus to help you take advantage of it. Um, you know, one of the best things that ever happened in my entire life, if not the best, was I actually... I got this working. Oh, does it work right now? Yep. Oh, cool. Good, now I can start running and moving. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, I met my wife at Sonoma State. She was a phenomenal softball player. I got to play baseball at Sonoma State and, and play, but I was, I was not the quality of athlete that my wife was. Um, she, I'm going to tell you how we met. I'm not trying to bore you, but she would show up late every single day to this class called Motor Learning. And one day I bumped in there in the hallway and I'm like, hey, why do you show up late every day? I mean, that's kind of making me mad, even though I wasn't that academic. Maybe I was just trying to find a way to talk to her. But um, she really didn't give me an answer. And it kind of made me mad because she kept showing up late. Well, about a month or two later, she had to give a talk in another class. And she gave a talk about her best friend, this guy named Kyle. And he was in Sacramento working at a round table pizza attending Sacramento State. And somebody came in and held him up at gunpoint along with his employees and sat him down, kneeled him down, and shot him all at gunpoint. At and the way she talked, it blew me away. And I went up and I apologized to her. And I said, gosh, I can't believe um, you went through that. And that was your best friend. And she said, yeah, it means a lot to me. Like, it was really hard to do, but I had to do it. Really touched my heart. Um, we ended up dating after that. And uh, yeah. And I had to put up with her being late. Yeah, there's no question about it. Down the road here, Piner Road. Uh, she was working at a subway, and a guy hopped over the counter and held her at gunpoint. Sorry if I get choked up. Held her at gunpoint for 45 minutes. Guy let her go. He did. She had to testify, and the guy went to jail. I don't know where he's at now. I don't know. I kind of lost track of it. My wife, or my girlfriend at the time, ended up getting some weird stuff going on with her body. Like, she started getting some rashes. She was playing softball, but she started getting some rashes on her body. She started having some pains. Um, it was very hard to diagnose, but she ended up, I believe, and most of the doctors believe, due to this trauma of being held at gunpoint, she ended up with an autoimmune disease, which she was carrying, but it had an out, a disease called lupus. And uh, yeah, she played her senior year. Most people don't know this that even played with her, but the last two months she played uh, softball, college softball, and was very very good at what she did on chemotherapy to suppress her immune system. I can honestly tell you she's the toughest person that I've ever met. Um, I'm going to fast forward some years. She would go up and down, you know, it's kind of like a reflection of life with people up here talking about, you know, you've, things just go up and down in life and that's the way lupus is. It, it kind of comes in flares and it's really difficult to deal with and then it'll go in remission for like two years. And uh, when, after we got married, her, excuse me, her lupus went in remission for a long enough time and um, we got okayed by UCSF to try to have a family and we did. 2003, our son was born, I'm proud to say, at the stroke of midnight. First baby born in the entire world, 2003. Okay, I got that out of the way. Um, so he was born, um, unfortunately, in 2008, my wife got really, really sick and ended up in a coma. And uh, she was medically induced for 30 days. It was super difficult, as you can imagine. She, she woke up, and uh, the inspiring part about that little story right there is that she worked her butt off. And we rehabbed and wa we started by like walking down the, the driveway and back, you know. Then it was the block and then it was, you know, out to the track. I, I had a sports training uh, uh, business at the time and she would come and train with the athletes a little bit. It was really cool to see um, how much she put into that. Um, excuse me. She made it back to school. She's a school teacher. One of her goals was to make it back to school to teach. She did so. A year to the day she exited the hospital, and that same week she made it back. Our son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. 
And we were like crushed again and we just kept like pulling together saying, we're going to be okay, we're going to make it through with this family. It just kind of felt like it kept, you know, knocking us down. And uh, just became really difficult to deal with. But fortunately, on the way to Children's Hospital, I remember my wife telling me, she was like, hey, you know what? She grabbed my hand and she said, you know, no matter how, how hard this diabetes is going to be to deal with, let's just make it the most positive thing we can have in our life. And we did. And diabetes today, my son's 16 years old. He attends Rancho Catati High School. I was just showing some uh, coach friends of mine over there that I can check his blood sugar on my phone. It's really cool. Diabetes has just become, you know, a way of life. Uh, I want to fast forward again to 2015. My wife wasn't doing well. The lupus had progressed and kept progressing and kept progressing. And uh, anybody here had a phone, has ever had a phone call or a text that changed their life forever? Yeah, quite a few. I hope it was a positive one. I got a phone call in the spring of 2015, and it was a doctor, his name's Dr. Livnat from UCSF and Sanford Medical Center, and he said, uh, Greg, I know we've been through a lot, but I just want to let you know that your wife has uh, six months to a year to live. And uh, you know how the heat gets turned up, like on big game days, and you start feeling the heat and the pressure? The heat got turned up in my life, and I knew that. I knew that diagnosis. I, kn I knew that that timeline was coming, but I guess I was afraid to face it, you know? And uh, I'm not real happy with how I got revealed because I started drinking. I stopped paying bills. Things just kind of got out of control. Like the heat got turned up more and more, and I felt it more and more. And I, uh, I guess maybe I was like letting go. But it was difficult. And I didn't realize what actually was going on, like how much I started drinking. And the shorter my wife's life got, the worse I got. On October 25th, my wife passed away. And things got even worse for me. The hardest thing I've ever had to do, no question about it, you know, was to tell our son that his mom passed away. And we weren't at the hospital. She was on life support, and we'd been there. You know, it was just a difficult time, and we weren't there, and I regret that. I wish I could take that back, but I can't. But I'm going to tell you, I got to a point. I started drinking more and more. I called up friends of mine. I'd have him come over and check on my son. Made sure he was okay, and he was. I wasn't like drunk off my ass, like staggering around, but I didn't trust myself. I'm very fortunate that I didn't drive anywhere. I was fortunate that I didn't like drink all day long. But I want to tell you something that I feel is that not only was I drinking, I was taking Xanax because I had unreal anxiety. I was taking blood pressure medicine because my blood pressure was through the roof. The drinking and the Xanax that I was taking, the problem that I had is like it numbed the bad. So it numbed all the pain and all the sorrow. And that was, I guess, the good part. But you know the bad part about drinking or drugs or you know, smoking the weed, the problem that I have is that it numbs all the good. It numbs all the happiness. It numbs all the joy. It numbs all the motivation. It numbs all the energy. You can't feel. It numbs everything. You can't selectively numb emotions. You can't do it. I mean, if you can't feel the bad and you can't feel the good, you start not feeling at all, and then you start losing hope. You end up depressed. That's where I ended up. I ended up, it was mid-December, and I was getting sympathy cards. I had $200,000 in medical bills, $14,000 in a funeral bill, $6,600 in credit card bills, and I had no idea how I was going to pay it. I knew I had good medical insurance, but I was afraid to answer the phone and get on the phone with the people to figure out how much I actually owed. I just knew the amount. I paid the mailman to put the mail in a box 
because it would fill up the mail slot every day. There's too much stuff coming in. And every day I'd go out to that box and I'd stack them up, stack up all these bills. Phone calls come in, didn't, didn't answer it. People reaching out to me to help me. No, I didn't take it. I was like the victim to everybody, to everything. It was like me against the world. Has anybody ever felt that way? It's like, you know, you wake up and it's like you against the world. Well, when you think that way, the world wins that. But the world's really not fighting against you, it's you. The help was there. People were reaching out. I was very fortunate. One day, I guess I was aware enough, I got my son to school, I had people come over and pick me up. My son up and we'd get to school. Knock on the door and I went up to the door and I opened it, didn't even look. Just opened the door, went back and sat on the couch. Guy walked in, guy I had recruited, had played for me. He walked in and he said, Hey, Greg, I'm not going to ask how you're doing, but those bills are getting higher. And what, what, are you, what are you doing? And I said, you know, if you came over here to motivate me, just go out. Everybody's trying to, you know, help me. Just go out. You have no idea what I'm going through. Once again, playing the victim, you know. And he said, no, 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 I'm not here to motivate you. I'm just disturbed a little bit. You've lost like 15 pounds and... You know, you're in the same spot. And I'm like, you know, come back tomorrow. You'll all be in the same spot. And he's like, okay, well, it just bothers me because you were one of the most positive people I'd ever seen in my entire life. That's why I came to Sonoma State. I wanted to play for you. He said, you know, do you remember, Greg, when I almost, uh, when I tried to commit suicide? And I said, I do. He said, do you remember all the trouble I was having? You helped me. Maybe, will you just let me help you? And I said, no, I don't, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm going to be able to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to get myself back. And he said, okay. He said, I just want to give you something that you gave to me because it helped me. And he gave me this envelope. In the envelope, I opened it up, and there was a quote that I had given to him. And it said, uh, life pays the price that you ask of it. Ask more of yourself, and life will pay the rewards. Like, oh man. It's like, thank you. And it really hit me hard. I was trying not to show it, you know. And he said, uh, I- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back tomorrow or the next day when I have more time. But I just want you to think about it. As soon as he left, the door closed and I started sobbing. I started crying. I was like, you know, I, I was in no place. I'm in no place like him. I mean, he tried to commit suicide. Like, I have everything in front of me. Especially my son. And here I am leading this like, this is the example that I'm setting? Like, what am I doing? I started crying. I mean, I was sobbing. I remember just being so pissed and so angry. I grabbed the envelope that it came in, and I crunched it up as hard as I can. And I slammed it against my forehead. And I just sat back on the couch. I was like, oh, God, I could feel, like, warm blood coming down. And I'm like, of course, you know. Once again, the victim to my own problem that I just created. So I take my hand and of course there's blood. I walk across my living room and into the bathroom and I turn on the light. And I looked in the mirror. And you talk about seeing the results that you don't want to see. They were right in front of me. And I'm going to tell you what, I hope I never forget it. Because I had blood like stains smeared into my face. There was a new blood trickle coming down, like around my eye and down. I mean, I looked horrible, absolutely horrible. And again, I hope I never forget it. Cleaned myself up a little bit, tried to stop the bleeding, and it was pouring blood out. Walked back, and I saw a shredder. And I don't condone this, and I'm not giving you advice if your life's really crappy. But I took all the bills and I just shredded them with like a smile on my face because I knew they were coming back. I knew they were coming back that afternoon and I knew those phone calls were coming. And I started shredding them and I was like happy about it. 
they were like grinding through, and I was like thinking, I hope this thing does not shut down or, or get you know, clogged up. I just want to grind all of them. Unfortunately, there was like PG&E bills and water bills that needed to get paid, and then they were urgent, and then you know, there was a notice that was going to be shut off, so of course my water got shut off in the like, next day or two, and PG&E got shut off and all that. But I'll tell you what, I was really happy that I did something and that I actually put a smile on my face that I was actually making progress because half those bills were just repeat bills. I'm going to tell you, that day I did something that changed my life. I made a phone call to my two best friends. First person I called, I said, I just want you to know I have a drinking problem. And she said, I know. And I said, what do you mean you know? She said, no, I've been watching. It's OK. I'm like, it's not OK. And she said, no, it's great. It's OK. You lost your wife. It's OK. I called my other friend, my best friend. He actually lost his wife the same age my wife died. Crazy. Crazy. Dan Leslie, best friend in the world. I called him and I said, I got a drinking problem. He goes, I know, I know, it's okay. So I was gonna wait until uh, the first of the year. And this was like, you know, December 15th. And I'm like, well, I beat you to it. He's like, Greg, it's gonna be okay. Thanks for reaching out. Man, the courage that you have to reach out and ask for help, we're gonna get this. They came over, sat down and made a list of things that I could do to start changing my life. I started with cleaning up my life, cleaning up the dialysis machine that had been there for six years because every day my wife took dialysis. I got the medicine, bags and bags of medicine, got it out of there. It was oxygen tanks, oxygen machines, and just got it out of there, just cleaned it up. It was like, the feeling was, it's like cleaning your room when you're a kid, you know, every once in a while, because I was kind of a messy kid. Like, you clean it up and then you lay on your bed like, you know, it's like you've got this cool room again, you know? That's what it felt like. I'd walk into a house that didn't have all of that stuff. I made a list of seven people to call on top of those two best friends to let them know that I had a problem and I needed to stand up for myself and you need to hold me to it. And you know what? They all helped. If there's a problem that you have that's similar, reach out for help. Guarantee you there's people there. People on campus here, you can't find anybody, remind, look at my ugly face and t uh, email me at Sonoma State. I'll help you. I'll get you the numbers you need. I'll get you the therapy you need. All these people here, they're here to help you. Other things I did, I knew that I needed to feel good. So I started working out. I told you before that I had a sports training business go to the gym. I loved being at the gym, but I got away from it. Not to have big muscles or to, to lift tons of weight. I know some of you guys need to, you know, be stronger, to be better players. I get that. But get in there and just do something to feel good. It made me feel good. You know, your self-image just made me feel good about myself. I started training all the time, doing all kinds of things. Now it's like one of my favorite things, back to being one of my favorite things in my life. I had a list of things that I started doing. I want to share with you just a couple more because to me it's really important when you're down. Is that I started making a list, like a day list of my best day. Like everything that I was going to get done from the time I got up. If I had a perfect day, if I had all the money in the world, all the confidence in the world, what could I do in that day? Made a list of things. And what I started realizing was, is that when I did that, I saw that it was like all decisions in there, what I was choosing to do, they're all linked in a positive way. See, all decisions are linked. Like the decision that you're making today has something to do with tomorrow. I, I want to ask you this question because it's going to happen. I see it every year at Sonoma State. Every single year. It's going to happen this weekend. Somebody shows up, new roommates, new backpack, new clothes. They show up the first day to school early. Place is packed. They got to park far away. They don't care. They get to their class. They're all excited. 
They get the syllabus and they underline the email address, they email the phone number so they can text them the office hours. They take the notes they're supposed to take. They go home, they eat the healthy lunch. They show up early to practice. There's people there like the rest of your team's kind of there, or good, you know, a good majority of your team's there. They listen to what the coach says. They go through practice really hard and they get better. They improve, leave practice, go to the weight room and lift, do things really good, go home and eat a healthy dinner. Phone call rings, the phone rings. Friend says, hey, we're going out tonight. We're playing uh, beer pong. You want to come? Says, yeah. Go out and play beer pong and... Uh, don't have one or two beers, you have three or four because all decisions are linked. Wake up tired the next morning, don't show up early to class, but you make it on time. Don't take, quite take the notes you're supposed to take. Don't quite eat the, the, the super nutritious lunch. Don't show up to practice super early, just show up in enough time. Go through the motions at the weight room, Go home, phone rings, and the person says, yeah, we're having a little uh, pool party. Why don't you come over? Yeah, yeah, come over. Well, you don't have three or four beers. You have five or six or seven or eight or whatever you have because all decisions are linked. And you leave there not eating a nutritious dinner. You go through the drive through and you get some sort of crappy meal. And you don't wake up for class. And you don't eat the healthy lunch, and you don't show up early to practice. You just show up with enough energy to go through the motions. And you do the same thing at the weight room, and you go home, and the phone rings. And one day becomes two, becomes a week, becomes a month. And then you wake up in December. This person wakes up in December, and you're like, what the hell happened? Well, what happened was all decisions were linked. Because when you had your eye on the prize, and your goal was set, and all these decisions you had to make to get there in your perfect day, and you were making them, it's easy to stay on track. And if you make a bad decision, and you say, okay, well, I show up a little bit late, then it's easy to get back on. But when all decisions are linked and you're making bad decisions, you start getting off course. And to me, the way to get back on course is to go look in the mirror and figure out what you're doing. The results are in the mirror because you can't transfer blame. It's just you that's in the mirror. You can't make excuses. You can't point it the finger at somebody else. You know what you do when you make excuses? You give your power away. When I was playing the victim, I was giving the power to everybody else. The power lied within me. The power lies within you. Don't give it away. Don't blame somebody else. Go take care of it. Go get the help you need. Go see the counselor. Go see the coach. If you're not getting the results that you want, go get the help. Look in the mirror. You can do it. I say this about decisions. I heard this a long time ago. You guys wouldn't even know this coach, Skip Bertman. You wouldn't even know this guy. He said, if you've got a decision to make, use the acronym BEST. B-E-S-T. When you have a decision to make. So is that decision, is it going to make me better, more efficient, stronger, and T, is it good for the team? Obviously, if you're going to answer no, you shouldn't make that decision, right? We all know right from wrong, but best. I want to say this, that I think one of the biggest problems that I've had and that I see out of the college athletes, the one problem that continues is confidence. If they ask me to teach a six-year-old how to hit a baseball or throw a baseball right now, piece of cake. No, no problem with confidence. Ask me to play uh, the piano right now in front of you guys, <laughs> there'd be no confidence. I went to a therapist and she said, Greg, you know how to build confidence. It's just like how you make a baseball player or how you help somebody get better at something. You practice. So all that negative talk that you're telling yourself, make sure that when you look in the mirror and you figure out the things that you're not doing right, make sure you give yourself credit. Give yourself credit for being right here, right now. 
and that this is where your feet are. I'm going to leave you with this. It's a few words from Edgar Guest, who's a famous American poet. And what Edgar Guest said was, he said he'd be all that a mortal could be tomorrow, that none would be braver and stronger than he tomorrow. A friend who was trouble and weary he knew, who needed a lift and wanted one too, on him he would call to see what he could do tomorrow. Oh, he stacked up the letters he was going to write tomorrow. He thought of the friends he could fill with delight tomorrow. It was too bad indeed that he was too busy today and hadn't a moment to stop on the way. More time I'll give to others, he would say, tomorrow. Oh, the greatest of workers this man would have been tomorrow, and the world would have known him had he ever have seen tomorrow. But the fact is he died and he faded from view. All that he left when his living was through was this huge mountain of things that he intended to do tomorrow. Don't wait till tomorrow. Take it all in today. Enjoy every ounce of this. Every day of this. You get to be here. You get to do this. And when things go bad, they're gonna. In your game, in your contest, in life, in your classroom. Think about this. That life doesn't happen to you. Life happens for you. I want to thank you very much for having me here today. You guys have been awesome. Thank you. You're very welcome. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. I enjoy what you guys are doing. I really enjoy <laughs>